Hey everyone, we're going to get started in just a minute. We just got the recording running and people are still kind of filtering in the building. Uh, we did not have technical difficulties this time, so we are just about good to go. So give us another 30 seconds and we'll get going. If uh, you can hear me, don't say anything. You all should be muted, hopefully. That was what the joke was. You didn't get it. Minimize this thing. What are the odds if I hit X that it stops recording? Not very good. Let us do this. <sighs> All right, let's get going. So thank you for coming to the fourth, I think fourth in the series of sneak and release meetings. Uh, so if you notice on my like 15th update to the meeting schedule, uh, we changed the meeting just to be called release meetings going forward. So one of the things I think we've talked about it before we want to get away from is us telling you about stuff that we're working on, um, potentially giving you dates and then things getting moved around, priorities getting changed, and then you having told people dates or deliverables or features that aren't actually going to be done when we said it was going to be done. So one of the core tenets of product is do what we say we're going to do when we say we're going to do it. And so to avoid um, any kind of dissonance with uh, customers, we don't tell you things before they're pretty close to done, if not done. So uh, you'll see that we did very intentionally rename this, uh, the release meeting, to be in line with that mentality. So let's hop into it. I'm going to start off with just a few updates. So I hope I spelled sermon right. Is that how you spell sermon? Close yeah, it's close enough. Gets the point across. So just want to talk about a few things about how we're always improving. So I haven't been in the office for the last two weeks. Um, all of us have been traveling a ton, all in the um, name of improving ourselves in the department and kind of what we're working on. So I want to at least give a little overview uh, about what I've been uh, learning and some of us, I guess, along the way um, to kind of share some things and then we'll get into the actual releases. So uh, this last two week uh, sprint of travel, so to speak, two week sprint, get it? Um, I started in San Francisco. So we went to Genevieve, myself, uh, David Davuti, who's the lead analytics and data um, director of product. And then Chris Alexander, who's a UX designer working his way into product, went to San Francisco for a data visualization summit, a uh, big data summit, and we specifically signed up for the data visualization. So we went, listened to a bunch of speakers, learned um, from some of the coolest companies. So the highlights for me were uh, Uber, Airbnb, and Tesla. We listened to their lead designers on the data side or just on the general um, design side. It was pretty awesome. So some of the things they're, they're doing is they have dedicated uh, UX research tools that they've built themselves internally so they can do on the fly um, A-B testing. So I think, what was it, was it Uber or Airbnb? Airbnb maybe that had like 2,000 variations. That was Pinterest actually. So Pinterest uh, should be on the list. Had 2,000 variations of their website. So they say uh, there are 2,000 different variations that could be on the website. So they say it's almost impossible for any of us to have the same experience at any time because there's so many multivariates being changed around at any given time. So I think it was like, the odds of you having uh, the same experience is like 0, 0.0 and then 25 more zeros and then two. Um, so again, just to, to kind of go to show something we want to learn is how to continue to improve our UX and design to make it more appealing and, and uh, functional and effective to the end user. So that was one of the main takeaways. Um, Uber had a really good um, presentation about their UI and UX style guide for, for even just data. So just the length they're willing to go to have a consistent experience all the way down to the colors they use in their charts internal, internally was really, really cool to see. And then I love Tesla, so it was cool to see them talk about stuff. They're really secretive. It was awesome. Uh, then uh, we met with Google down in San Clemente. So this is kind of a broader reaching topic. So this wasn't purely product, although we kind of owned uh, getting to this point. Shout out to Jennifer for getting us the meeting and the foot in the door. I've been trying to uh, get our status with Google upgraded for the past five years since I've worked here. I've uh, been out there at their offices, talked to them, complained that the program wasn't fair. Some of our biggest competitors have been in this uh, SMB program, which is like the small business premier um, program where there's all these other benefits which we'll talk about in a minute. I even bribed the guy at one point out of pocket. Um, this was with dealer fire, not dealer socket, so I didn't break any current rules, um, but it just never happened. So, uh, I mean, there's some G's involved, um, <laughs> cash bribe. Yeah. I mean, it was like a soft ride, like, haha, I'll give you a couple thousand if you let us do it, haha, but seriously, um, never worked. Um, so luckily, uh, Jennifer 
uh, was able to get us a meeting with some of the top guys uh, who she knew, um, and it kind of went from there. We went through this application process where they vetted us out, our services, and kind of how we do things, and they loved it. So we kind of jumped, even leapfrogged a couple steps and got straight into the, the onboarding program for this, which is pretty cool. Um, so I kind of put this out of order, so I'll start with the partnership itself. So we're now in the top tier management program for Google um, in the AdWords sense of things, or the PPC slash SEM. So what that means is they give us sales and marketing support, which includes budget. So they actually have budget set aside for us to help us do certain marketing initiatives. It could be um, in-person uh, meetings out at Google where we could bring our people out. They'll come, I think they're going to dedicate two people to come talk at our dealer socket user summit. Uh, there's money. They'll, they'll put, help put together white papers and advertisements for us, which is really awesome. Uh, in, in addition to sales and marketing, there's engineering resources. So as we continue to grow our program and have more spend, they're willing to put in uh, – more resources for us to use up to and including actual engineers that will come help us build out our PPC management system um, and some other related things. And then on the ops side, there's a very hands-on Calvin, I guess in this meeting it was Calvin, uh, my, uh, Wes, myself, Jennifer, um, Todd, Andrew, um, some other people, I don't remember so many people at this point. But anyway, all of us because it touches all of us. So Calvin is out there um, with Wes to talk about the operations. They're going to help us manage our accounts more effectively. We get in on a lot more betas, we get news about changes to Google uh, search listings before they even happen. Like for instance, they're increasing the length of ads you can have, which hasn't happened in 15 years. So it hasn't happened yet, but we know about it, which is kind of cool. Um, so anyway, the partnership um, brings some other advantages. So like for instance, the performance uh, point up top, they let us know that compared to all of our competitors in the program, which is all of the main ones, we have a 50% better click-through rate than average, which they're telling us, hey, put this in your ads because it's going to help you. So it's a pretty big um, win for us for them to even get. We would never have the intel otherwise. So it's just straight from their mouth. We're allowed to put their stamp on it and say, hey, this is a, a fact from Google. So if you don't know, click-through rate is the amount of people that see an ad versus the amount of people that click through. So that means we're writing better ads. We're putting ads in front of the better people or whatever. There's something we're doing right to make sure people are actually interested in what we have to say, um, which is huge. So it's a better use of our customers' dollars. And then lastly, uh, some pending items. Uh, they're going to hook us up with some swag. I don't know at what point this happens, but they said they're going to send us some stuff. It used to, for those legacy employees, we used to get Google stuff uh, pretty often, which is awesome. Um, so, and then we're going to go out to Google HQ. Not all of us, of course. Uh, not yet, anyway. Um, but a few of us are going out to their headquarters and meet with some of the executives in June. Um, and there will be more opportunities. They'll probably come out here at some point as well. And there will be different training events where they'll sponsor teams, our teams to go out there and see headquarters and different offices, which is awesome. And then lastly, the most important thing with the program is that it opens us up to getting uh, what they call rebates. So some of our biggest competitors in the program get up to a 12% rebate on the money they spend with Google. So uh, if we were to spend $10 million with Google, which is what we're kind of aiming towards right now, we would get uh, up to $1.2 million back for nothing, for doing the same things we do today just because we're in the program. So that's a huge, uh, huge potential. So the only thing we need to do is sell more um, PPC, grow our, our uh, kind of our revenue in PPC to, to earn this right. So that's the last thing we have left to do. And so that's what they're trying to help us do with all these things. Then we were out in Utah for a leadership meeting on the R&D side. So all of development and product leaders um, were out there. There was a bunch of, of things learned. I wanted to just pinpoint one of them, which was planning. I think uh, individually, we've done a really good job at, at implementing planning since we didn't do a great job of it before. When we were in startup mode, we were a little more agile a little more off the cuff, it was Mark, myself, and Farouk just going, yeah, this, this sounds good, let's go for it, more or less. So what we want to do is implement more phases of planning so we can get more input from everybody else. We kind of started this in Q1 with the um, product council meetings where you got all your leadership into the meeting itself, uh, gave input on what we needed to fix, what we needed to build, and their input on things we had ideas on and kind of rank those things so we can start to get more input. Now, if that works correctly, you're talking to your directors and, or managers supervisors and then they're talking to us so you have direct in, input that being said as you should know through the PD website you can go ahead and put your own ideas in there and we want to do a better job of vetting those ideas out to make sure we're working on the most important most impactful um, things as we move forward so that was the biggest takeaway I think for us and we talked about everything in, in addition to um, planning this is just one section that kind of hit home that I wanted to kind of make an effort to promise to you is that we will see better improved planning which will then help us communicate better as we move forward too so next on the road trip, I've been back at my house for about 12 hours, and then uh, we leave right after this meeting to go to Milwaukee to fly up to Dallas. So um, something that's kind of changing for the rest of the company, but not so much for us, is that 
we're taking design and moving it under product as opposed to engineering. So before a product would have an idea, um, kind of vet out um, what features they'd like to see and what are some requirements, and they'd pass it to engineering, and then they'd design it, and then they'd run with it. Um, so we thought it would be a good experiment and semi-prudent to kind of shift the process up and put design more on the front end of things so that we can do more research, um, put more time into that from the product perspective, not the engineering perspective. For us, it's always worked that way, and I think it's gone extremely well, especially being a more consumer-facing uh, product. So I, I think um, we'll just continue to do what we're doing but improve upon it. So Dro and myself are going down to present uh, well, Jero's going down with to present uh, digital retail, and Mark's going down just to be, he's a, a leader on our, our design staff on our side in general. So the three of us will be making the trip here shortly. Um, and again, back to the point about the Airbnb and uh, the, the research side really excites me, doing more vetting of our designs themselves. It's not just us going, yeah, it looks pretty good, let's run with it. So that is it for my update. So I think we have Genevieve up next to talk about some Ignite releases. As she makes her way. Let me check the chat. Oh, she said stop talking about that. <laughs> Sorry, Jennifer. All right, Genevieve's up. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about we've been working on Ignite, and apparently I can't. Look. Okay. <laughs> um, the first thing I want to talk on, because I think it's, my unofficial role right now to be bad cop in the group. All the guys are so fun. Um, I want to talk about the product request form. So we really love all the requests coming through. It gives us a lot to go off of and kind of hear your guys' input from it and a chance to hear kind of what you guys hear from the customers as well. I do want to reiterate, just because you submit a form does not mean we're going to build it and definitely does not mean we're going to build it the second it comes through. So I think there's been a little bit of confusion mm -hmm. <laughs> on that. So we get a ton of requests coming in on that front, so several a day at this point. Um, and we love that, it gives us a lot, a lot of different feedback and a lot of your opinions on, different opinions on the same thing. Um, but the intent behind that is to give us something to research. So if you submit it through, we're going to look at it, we're going to research into it, but it does not necessarily mean we're going to build it. So just, we've had a few requests come through and people asking, well, I submitted it, I haven't seen anything or heard back on when it's gonna be built. So just, just to kind of give you a heads up, if it's something that's absolutely critical, there's no way around it, customer has to have this and we need it ASAP, um, make sure you're reaching out to the product managers and stuff too, reach out to me, reach out to Kevin, and we can make sure you're talking to the right person and we can it along a little bit, but that form is not intended as a quick, here's a bug that needs to be fixed in the next three hours kind of thing. Does that make sense? All right. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, on that note, I have two slides here that will be posted online, part of the product dev site, if you want to review them. These are just some of the smaller issues and add-on requests that have come through from you guys that we built on um, the Ignite side over the last two sprints. And these aren't anything super fancy, so I'm not gonna do individual slides, I'm not gonna go through these individually, but if you're curious, um, I've been trying to reach out to you guys individually when we build something that you specifically requested. Um, but if you're curious, some of those smaller projects, you can take a look at these slides. All right, next one is kind of on that same front. We've gotten a lot of feedback on the new Ignite style guide, which is great. Um, there's more updates coming. So from the initial release, there were some sections that got missed that still kind of had the old Ignite colors mixed in with the new ones. Um, we tried to update a little bit more this last sprint to try and match Blackbird a little bit better and also just make some visual improvements, the things that were a little odd. Um, so we did listen to your feedback and got some of those pushed through, and that is now live. As a side note, yes, the tabs with the gray, with the white text, looks terrible, and we are working on that right now. So you'll, you'll see that next release. That should be coming through this next sprint. So that's not a permanent thing, and I've heard all of your feedback on that, and we're working on it. Next one is privacy policy. So this one kind of goes hand-in-hand hand with all the crossfire. 
Um, I know especially the account management team has been involved with this one. So essentially this has been an update to our current privacy policy, just some terminology changes, added some stuff that again relate directly to Crossfire and how we're collecting data and disclosing that. The reason we worked on this, legal reasons, and we actually got all of this wording directly from the dealer socket legal team. So essentially what this is doing is we've updated our current privacy policy wording. And then for anybody that has customized it, um, this next sprint we're going through and tacking it onto the bottom of what they already had, just to make sure that we're following any federal regulations, disclosing everything that we're collecting and making sure that's all in compliance. Next one is Bing Ads Customer Account ID Field. So this one is gonna to pertain to the PPC team and I've got in the slide exactly where you'll find it, but essentially we built this out so that we can improve those OEM reports that we're sending out to include Bing now has been the latest push. And also the idea is to start moving forward with reporting on the PPC side. So Google AdWords and Bing Ads. So this will help us connect kind of which Bing accounts connect with which websites, so we can start expanding out those dashboards a little bit further. Next one, inventory report that we talked about last time. Just a new feature that came in from a few client requests has been to add that edit ability directly from that. So essentially the scenario they're running into is customers are looking to find which vehicles did nobody view in the last 14 days. They never opened up that BDP page, but they were looking at it on the SRP. And that way they can see, oh, well, this one has all stock images. Maybe I wanna go in quick, edit it right away and add some images up to it. Or maybe I wanna mark that one as a special, decrease the price, do something with the vehicle so it lets them do it right from that interface quickly. Next one is the Ignite app. So I do wanna emphasize this is not live and it won't be live for several weeks yet. The iOS portion of it is done being developed now we're working on the Android section, and basically our rule of thumb is to release them both together. So we're just kind of waiting on the Android side, but essentially this is gonna add a new feature to the app to manage staff, add a new staff member, and then manage and add new groups. So here's a few screenshots of kind of what that's going to look like, or already looks like in the iOS. I think it's a great update right now for Pam, but someone wants to add staff. If you don't know tonight, put in your name, put in the bio, take pictures, upload the pictures to the computer, drag and drop the files, and we've got, I think, a user at night that Jennifer and I and the team have been working on is more ways to uh, media capture. So, what I mean, we've already do pictures of vehicles, but uh, slideshow images and kind of doing a, at some point a UI guideline. So, if you have round pitch staff pictures, it's going to show you here's the size of the pictures you can take. So, Looking at the crop, just make sure you get the picture right the first time to only upload the, the portion that, that we need. So I think that's a really cool update that opens up some doors for the mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, a, that was a big request from dealers, being able to add staff a little bit easier, doing it right from the phone, being able to take the picture and add it right to it. Next one was an internal request that came from the production team, was to add that by appointment only option to the department hours. So the interface in Ignite is done being built. We're waiting on some front end updates to make sure that it all transfers over smoothly. So that'll be going live this month. Um, that you'll find under that website settings department info, but essentially here's a look at what the interface will look like. I'm not even gonna click through on it because I know I'm terrible with these Apple computers and I will never get back. Um, but essentially adding that option to add by appointment only for a specific day, or if a department is only by appointment, you can check that box and it'll apply it across all days. So you guys don't have to custom code that in. Um, the last one I wanna talk about is a tracking URL builder, and this will be going live this week. Um, some of this stuff, our programming team is on holiday right now, so it'll be a couple of days before this goes live, but it will be going live this week. Essentially, it's an interface that we created to work with the Google UTM tracking code. So Google recently made it so you don't do that directly from their site. And I know there's a lot of subsites out there and it's something that we really push customers to make sure they're adding tracking URLs if they're doing some sort of campaign with um, Pandora 
and they have it, you can click through to their website and they're, can Pandora tell me we're getting this much? How do I know if that's true? Well, we really recommend that they use these tracking URLs. It lets us really dig down a lot easier. And um, this is something that we're adding in that will be available for all internal users and for all customers right off the bat. You'll find it under the website data section once it goes live. It's gonna be right at the top there above reporting. And essentially right now, I know internally content team uses it for their press releases. So this will just be, instead of having to hunt down or Google where you're, you're gonna find one of these, we're just moving it right into Ignite. I'm gonna open it up quick. They explained to you how to do it, but their interface went away where you can just plug it right in. And of course it went away right after I, okay. So I'm not gonna show it to you. <laughs> I'll go back to the live one, or did I X out of it? Oh. Okay. Cool, this is why they don't give me an apple. Um, so yeah, essentially all you're gonna have to do, there's gonna show you which categories that we have to plug in, and we threw in tool tips that help the client understand what they're supposed to put in for each category. It's gonna pop out the tracking URL that they can copy and paste wherever they want on other websites, on other camp marketing campaigns that they're doing. So it's a neat little interface for them to be using. And next is that cabin. They should be able to unmute yourself. I'll let you sit and I can run the slides for you. I might uh, tack a footnote on it too. The app. Right, the app, I don't know how many of you use the app or have looked at it recently, but it is quietly becoming a pretty powerful tool for dealers and, and soon to become a pretty like, nice differentiating feature that we have versus other vendors. So if you're in account management or sales uh, support, like start looking at the app and what it can do and familiarize yourself with that so that when you hear those requests or when you hear a customer pain point and the app might be a solution for it, uh, you can start to be able to tell that to our customers. Because once we get the staff edition in there, there's way more that the app can do thanks to Genevieve and her team's work over the last, what, three, four, five months. And it can do so much more than it used to do, which is really just like inventory stuff. Um, but it, it, we're just, as we started this project, we looked at what customers did in Ignite the most and what they did is ignite the most from their phone through the like Ignite website. And so we're just tapping, checking off all of the most popular Ignite features and adding those into a, you know, the native app experience. So it's pretty cool and you know, we wanted to have more customers using it and championing it um, as, a, as a reason why they want to use the other file. Download the uh, Google Play or iOS app store today. <laughs> All right, Kevin, do you want to unmute yourself and start running? There you go. Yep. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep. I'm going to mute. Uh, right, so great. run with it and let me know when to uh, change the slides. Okay. Sounds good. So let's first start off with Engine 5, which is current website platform. A few releases to talk about here to begin with. So number one, uh, new search filter sliders that are located in SRP on our website. So specifically, this was to address two basic needs. Number one was something that was a little bit easy on the mobile side of things, especially if you use this on your iOS device or on your Android device. And um, also something that's a little bit more in line with what we're doing as Jiro will talk about with Engine 6 as well. And the biggest thing here is with year, price, and max mileage, especially on used vehicles, we wanted to get away from the manual input um, of actual numbers into the SRP. So this addresses that need. Go ahead to the next one, Aaron. The next one is service many coupons. So using a configuration, support can actually enable this on the dealer side and it's per site. Uh, dealers can actually display up to three of their most recent service coupons in the service menu of the main navigation. So if they click on that specific image, and it's actually a preview, it's limited to a certain number of characters so that we don't take up too much room. 
But if the dealer or whoever, the consumer, clicks on that coupon image, it'll actually be delivered directly to the coupon page. So it gives the dealer a little bit more visibility, especially if you're working with them on um, any sort of marketing with their fixed ops, which will be a big focus that you'll see on the OEM side of things. Um, but without having the consumer to actually click all the way through to service specials, it allows them to see a preview of that coupon directly in the menu itself. So again, that's the three most recent, um, and it's actually not recent, it's, it's dependent on the sort order of the coupon. So if you're familiar with Ignite, at the very bottom, there's a custom input field for sort order, and it'll choose up to your top three priority coupons, I guess you could say. Go to the next one, Aaron. Uh, we've been working on showrooms quite a bit, um, something that you'll see a big update to coming probably by the end of Q2, which I won't talk about right now. Um, but for AutoNation specifically, um, we've added the 2017 Chrysler Pacifica um, as a showroom option and then also as an MDP. Um, so all of this takes, <clears throat> I'm sure as most of you know, a pretty um, substantial amount of effort, not only from the design team um, who gives us images, but also from the content team for the most part. Um, so a big, uh, a big ups to everybody that kind of worked on this, especially as we need to add these, you know, ones and two models as we go along for the AutoNations and Omnis of the world. So uh, that's the Chrysler Pacifica added to showroom specifically. Go to the next one, Aaron. Okay, now into OEM stuff. So I said before with service coupons, fixed ops has been a huge priority for OEMs over the last uh, six months or so. And uh, one thing that I'll, I'll kind of bring up as well, and I won't mention who the OEM was, but last week we actually just completed um, a webinar and RFP um, for an OEM that was specifically looking for um, a market partner on the fixed op side. So it's a huge, huge um, priority for these OEMs, as some of you have probably been selling content marketing and PPC know. Um, so as I go through these things, just kind of keep in mind um, that it's a big thing that the, the OEMs are trying to keep visibility on uh, moving forward. So first off, if you remember, um, VW or Volkswagen has a huge initiative with after sales pages. So everything from tires to their service credit card to service event pages, they have probably between 10 and 15 different pages that are actually automatically added to Volkswagen dealers' sites based on API. So as you can imagine from the support side and from the production side, it's pretty hard to keep track of exactly what dealers are enrolled in what pages. So programming put together a really nice shared document that actually automatically in real time based off of URL, pulls in all the after sales pages links um, to a shared document. So if we need to make updates to one or two pages or if we need to go through and update, update disclaimers, all we have to do is go into this doc and actually search out the exact page that we need to update and we can just mark it as we go along. So most things can be done globally and programmatically for the most part, but if we need to see you know, exactly what pages the dealer's enrolled in, we don't necessarily have to reach out to shift every time for that. We can just see exactly what pages they actually have on their current site. So as I said before, efficiency gain and support especially for those program updates. Next one, Aaron. Uh, Volkswagen has service events that they update quarterly. Um, so Volkswagen as a corporate entity will actually send out these global coupons, if you will, to every dealer's website. So the Q2 packet came in a few weeks ago and we had to send this into programming to get updated. Um, every Volkswagen dealership should have this and it contains um, essentially through an API uh, coupon images, content, uh, specifically what the offer is, um, and then also the ability to print those coupons. So this was updated just recently. Next slide. We're also working on a VW accessory CLP. Um, some of you in support know that Volkswagen has started moving all of their accessory specific content over to a company called Simple Part, which is essentially a subdomain like parts.speedcraftvolkswagen.com. And that's a way that they can actually incorporate accessories purchasing um, on their website by using a subdomain. So what we're working on right now, and specifically Mark, who put together the mock-up, and Jesse, who's working on this on the VW.DealerFire site, is we're putting together a secondary or ancillary accessory CLP. So for dealers that don't enroll in the simple part subdomain, they'll actually get this placed on their site. Next one, Aaron. Uh, Jaguar has been extremely vocal um, in the launches of the brand new 2017 F-Pace and XE. Um, we've done some showroom pages for these. Uh, we've had some um, pages put on site where consumers can actually go and reserve theirs. They can actually put money down. So now all the Jaguar dealerships that we have currently enrolled are actually having launch events for both of these models set for specific times in May. So we had to create a CLP on all of our Jaguar sites on our dev site that actually allow the consumer or user to RSV, RSVP to these specific events. Next one, Aaron. 
Uh, this is a pretty big one. Um, as a certified website provider for a lot of our programs, we're given a lot more access to OEM data that we wouldn't necessarily have otherwise. So for JLR, we actually work with a company called DMI, which presents um, or uh, gives us, I should say, a uh, supplemental inventory feed. And that inventory feed contains things like OEM package codes, pricing, and additional features. Um, and it's all based on model code. So what we're working on right now, specifically with Azam and programming, and uh, Perrin Kelsey on the Ignite side, and Genevieve being the Ignite um, product owner, we're actually importing a lot of this data through DMI to dealers' websites that they would like to see. So if they want to see um, specific models that have uh, extended features on those models, we can actually use this to map into Ignite Comment 2 and 3 or any custom content field, comment field that they want in Ignite, and then we can actually code it over to the website as well. This was actually a specific request from a client that we were working with um, that was looking to enroll in the JLR program, um, but it's available globally to JLR dealers now. So if you have a dealer that's looking to get a little bit more info, um, especially those OEM products or OEM packages, um, we can now map those to the VDP on the website. Next one, Aaron. This was a very, very big project for everybody involved. Um, special shout out here to uh, Mitch in design and Jesse as well as we worked on getting these pages together. Again, fixed ops, Toyota has a huge um, initiative where they're putting about 13 different CLPs on any dealer site that opts into this specific service. Um, everything from tires to, um, I think they have some sort of express um, express care program and then also Toyota care. So the idea here is that Toyota wants these pages available to dealers uh, at the ready. So the dealer can just call into support and say, hey, need these you know, fixed op package sites or pages on my website. So Jesse and the design team actually created these pages on a dev site so we can clone them over a little bit easier. This is kind of the first step into, into OEM page management. Um, which will actually allow us to create pages globally and assign them to sites that we um, that we designate or let dealers assign them almost like a template for the most part. So this was a pretty big project. It took us almost the entire month of April for the most part, um, but Toyota is extremely satisfied with our work on it. Um, they've been really vocal um, in their um, in their um, projects, especially recently um, with some of the other vendors, which I think we mentioned last time have been dropped off program. So dealer fire is in a really good position right now with Toyota, especially doing projects like these. Next one, Aaron. So those of you in account management support probably have heard this quite a bit. Um, Mazda just in the last, oh, 30 to 60 days revamped their digital website program. So all dealers have essentially two options. Either number one, they can enroll with dealer.com or CDK and get a automatically compliant website, or they keep their current website and it's just reviewed for compliance and their you know, basically open to any compliance violations that might happen. As part of that, um, Mazda is requiring for all of their websites also to have this Adobe Analytics script installed on every single site so they can track all of the analytics for the website, kind of like what we do with Shift, but this isn't a Shift mandated program that we work in. So we needed to create the ability to not just send in a support request for every single Mazda dealer that signs up and get the script added to the site, Instead, we actually handled it kind of like JLR and Volkswagen and Kia, where we actually um, have a toggle in Ignite. Uh, production can just activate, or support can just activate that toggle, and it'll actually activate uh, Mazda Adobe Analytics on site. So something we figure we could scale a little bit easier if you have dealers asking about that. Next one, Aaron. And then our famous Acura updates. Um, just as an FYI, program launch is actually the end um, of this week. So we're getting extremely close for it. Um, that doesn't mean site launch, this means enrollment launch. So essentially, dealers will have the opportunity to hear webinars from every single one of the five different vendors. They'll get to choose who they wanna go with, kinda like the Kia program. They'll enroll at that point, get on the phone with our production team, and we'll go through the build process. We're not expecting sites to launch until about June 1st. Um, basically, every single technical integration, there's about 17 total. Um, is in programming right now and hopefully going into current sprint, but that gives us about a month to make sure that everything is buttoned up. So working hard on this one, um, definitely want to make sure that it's a really successful program, much like our other ones. And uh, there's a few things that I just wanted to, to call uh, a mention to um, that's an accurate specific integration, especially for the production folks, and that's things like new car pricing um, and validation there. Dealers will actually get a chance to select if they want to show MSRP or MSRP plus distribution and handling or their own pricing that comes directly from the DMS. 
They'll also be able to show all their CPO and in-transit inventory on site, which is something that we've kind of done previously, um, but also not on the OEM program level. And then also VIN validation. Um, we'll actually create um, a folder where uh, Acura will send us all of the VINs in their entire system uh, to our program and to our platform to see if it matches up with VINs we're receiving through inventory feeds. So quite a bit going on there. Um, this will be good for us because it kind of pushes our programming team, it pushes our product teams to make sure that we're um, in compliance with these programs and future programs as well. So getting really close to that. Any questions about any OEM programs or Acura specific, just make sure to reach out to me directly. I'll get those answered for you. And I think that's it. Yeah. So Eric Duro is up next. So one of the things we discussed early on is we don't want to show uh, things that aren't done yet. But that being said, we do want to create visibility and ownership and uh, get input from you guys in some of the, things, the bigger items that we're working on. We hope you get excited about it and, and uh, can kind of feel the excitement that we have, particularly Eric will communicate those things. But uh, we are going to show you some things uh, that are coming out in the future. Just know that these aren't to be communicated outside of here. Um, and if you abuse that privilege, uh, we will revoke it. Uh, I'll be the bad, guy, bad cop for once. Um, so please uh, listen, get excited, engage with Eric and the team on these things, but know that they are very uh, forward-looking, um, so don't blow it. If we did release, he's only had nothing to talk about. And I like the sound of my voice too much to be excluded from the me. so we're on the show here. Um, unless you want to click the space bar for me. What? Um, I think so, yeah. Oh, yeah, are we muted? I'm muted. Yeah, all right, cool. All right, so a little bit of context here about like what Engine 6 is. I think a lot of us have the idea, which is correct, that Engine 6 will be this new website platform, new look and feel for our dealers and their customers, and that's all correct, right? But that's all possible through Engine 5. I mean, Tad and the Engine 5 and Epsilon team, they create new modules and new themes to modules all the time. So technically, we could just reskin every module we have on Engine 5, and we could call it Engine 6 and it would look like that. But the reason why it's different and it's a new engine is because we're fundamentally changing the way that websites are built and maintained at DealerFire. So right now, as most of you know, but I, you know, I know some of you don't, so we'll just go through the basics here. Um, when a website is built at DealerFire, there's basically two tools that we use to build it, right? There's Builder and Ignite. And, um, Builder, if you've ever seen it, is not state-of-the-art. It's a little bit archaic, right? So Engine 6 is combining the two. So instead of having these two management interfaces, we will put everything in Ignite. And so that's really kind of the, the major fundamental change. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that's very technical about the way servers are set up and all sorts of fun things that, you know, our programming engineering teams are brilliantly putting together for us so that we have, um, you know, very high-performing websites. But that's kind of the, the idea, translating to customers and ease of, of, of um, management of your website for uh, power users at the dealership, but also to gain a lot of efficiency internally for support and production to, and even account management, perhaps, to make changes that dealers need on the fly. So that's, that's kind of engine six. So instead of just showing you some front end modules, I also kind of wanted to show you what the new back end will look like. And we call that builder two, even though that's going to live inside Ignite. So there's a whole bunch I could show you, but trying to stay in the vein of not, um, you know, getting too excited with things that aren't available yet, just an, an idea of what this looks like, of what this might look like. So uh, this is what we call the module gallery. And from here, and say you were building a page, any page on the website, um, you can see all these modules that are available, right? And you just drag them onto the screen and bam, they're there. And the grid system's all there, so it's not like our WYSIWYG editor now, which is definitely not what you see is what you get. It's what you see is not even close to what you get. So what you see in this builder will be what you get. So there's no need to preview or anything like that. Um, and it's just going to be a very uh, modernized uh, web development tool. Uh, so you have this module gallery, and here are just a couple of the uh, cool, simple um, 
examples of what it's capable of. So if you were to select forms from the module gallery, you would then see a bunch of form templates, ones that are commonly used across sites and always used on kind of like a standard template site right out of the gate, like a contact department or contact us, all of those. And then you can drag that form template onto the site and you can, you know, say it's gonna be one column, half the page, full page, all of that. Um, and then, uh, so we have these preset modules and then different templates of those modules that are then dragged and dropped into the page builder or page editor. And then from there, there are configuration options that used to live in builder but are now right here. And the configuration options are really like the sprinkles on the cupcake that is this delicious uh, delectable of, of engine six. And the configuration options are, uh, allow you to do anything. So from the simplest example that I can think of, like a button, you drag the button, you choose size, style, um, uh, links that you're linking to. what you're going to link it to. Do you want that link to open up in a new window or in the same window or tab? So um, that's the simplest example, but it's all right there. Right in the UI, there's no, you know, set target equals bracket blank underscore all that. Uh, so sorry for you people who like to put on the, the, the yellow frame glasses and, and get into the dirty work. But a lot of the stuff that, that you do will be right uh, available in the configuration options. So the efficiencies gained from this thing are going to be seriously awesome. Uh, so we're super excited about it and hopefully I don't screw it up and hopefully it works the way that we hope. And so far it does. Um, so what else? Drag and drop, these are just some recent ones and simple examples. And then also like field validation. So in the same way you fill out a contact form and you forgot to put the at symbol in your email address and it says, hey, there's an error here. If you were to make an error that our system can't compute and render on the front end, it's gonna give you field validation errors in the configuration element. So that's pretty, I mean, it's just a super user-friendly um, tool. Uh, you know, so easy, even a product manager can use it. So you support and production people will be totally fine. And just kind of a hidden egg in there. So one, cool that we can do drag and drop modules in module library. Uh, two, very specifically, there will be a form builder. So I know all you guys in support will be, in production will be happy. So it'll be a front end form builder where you can uh, not only choose from modern or, uh, popular form templates that exist, but you can create new ones, save them, and then use them in the future as your own uh, templates. And you can do multi-step forms, so one field at a time. It's not just, you don't have to do like a single page form. I mean, we can go on and on about all the cool stuff that it's going to do, but basically just the, 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 the fundamental difference between Engine 5 and Engine 6 is really um, this, right? And then on the front end, uh, there are also lots of changes that um, are going to be very exciting, I think, for uh, customers and, and everyone else. So one that we've worked on for uh, really heavily in, over the last month is our search results page which um, seems simple, but it's actually really complex as far as how those filters interact with one another, trying to figure out exactly the inventory the customer wants to see. Um, but here are some cool things that I think everyone could say our system is currently lacking and we, we are really excited about bringing these to the table. So two of my personal favorites are normalized colors and shop by payment. So when I say normalized colors, if you go to a website with you know 400 used cars, and you go to color, you see blizzard, pearl, silver, metallic, cat's breath, and whatever <laughs> else, right? I mean, it's just this long list. And honestly, it doesn't mean anything to the customer because I want to see just the black ones. And there could be 17 different variations of black, and none of them have the word black in it. So um, inventory providers like HomeNet are helping us by sending us generic colored names, and we're going to try and uh, do our own basketing of these colors to provide a really nice interface to allow customers to just search by colors that they've actually heard of before and not ones that are written on the side of the crayon. Uh, and then of course we can basket them into the unknown categories for all of those ones that we don't know. Uh, and then the other, which uh, Kevin alluded to in page five, uh, we'll be using sliders for a lot of stuff, but uh, one of the coolest ones as far as price goes is a, a smart system to shop by payment instead of just price. So you set a price range uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, five thousand to twenty-five thousand. I mean, yeah, that's cool. But if anybody's ever bought a car before, you know that that sticker price is not anywhere near what you actually pay, and you have no idea what your monthly payment is going to be. So, um, to get the most precise price possible without 
the next thing we'll talk about, which is digital retail, the best thing that we can do is help the user configure their payment terms. So the biggest variables that have an impact on your monthly payment are three things. How long you finance for, uh, the percentage, your, your uh, interest rate on your loan, and how much money you put down, right? So right now, we have one set of payment terms that are applied to all vehicles and prices on the site that we just hope are kind of near what a customer would want, right? So some people like to finance for 36 months, some like to finance for 72, some like to put no money down, some like to put half the money down, right? So we are going to implement a payment configuration model. Next slide, please. Uh, and so what this will do from uh, a few various places on the website, and this is the example you see on the SRP, this would be, imagine this entire page was a uh, was an SRP. You click on the payment configuration module and this would fly out from the side here on desktop. Um, and you can configure your payment terms. So, hey, I have great credit. I have 1.9% APR. I want to finance for five years and I'm going to put down $22,000 on my $50,000 upslot. And when you update pricing, it's going to update your monthly payments that appear for every vehicle on the website. So wherever the vehicles appear on the SRP, you'll see the price and you'll also see the monthly payment. And it'll take the lowest price in the price block, so if you have like an MSRP, minus dealer discount, minus rebates and all that, it'll take that minus your down payment, divide by blah, 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 go through all the you know, payment uh, formula, and then you'll get a monthly payment, which is going to be pretty close to what you would pay. and gives you a much better idea of what the payments will be. So uh, very excited about that one. I think it's going to make the SRP a much more useful thing for customers when they're actually shopping for cars, trying to figure out what they can afford, and getting them payments that fit their budget. Um, so that is uh, a couple of the things we're working on. Again, we're just kind of like showing just a few little sneaks. Uh, and the, the other project that I worked on is called Digital Retail. We talked about this one before. Um, you notice the, the rule number three, we do doing different rules every month. We talk about digital retail to a customer you're fired, Aaron just said it, and go to the back top. Uh, next slide, we just push this play button. It's just for fun. I made it cool. Uh, don't worry, Jennifer, this is an unlisted YouTube video, no one can see it. Uh, so, uh, I don't know how many of you were on the meeting where I first talked about digital retail, we showed a desktop UI, this is mobile UI that we've been working on for the past six weeks, um, and now we've got tablets, you know, uh, close to finishing up. But basically what digital retail does is kind of like that paint configuration module on steroids, right? There are many variables that go into the purchase price and monthly payment of the vehicle, including the three that we just mentioned. But what about taxes? What about incentives? What about uh, advertised offers from manufacturers? What about back end F and I products? What about dealer destination fees? There are so many things. But speak over here. I think the mic's oh, getting on. There are a bunch of different things that go into the price of a vehicle, and digital retail will help customers figure out exactly what a car will cost them, and it will give them very accurate uh, monthly payments and prices for vehicles. But even more powerful than that, and what will make our tool truly best of breed, is that because of our synergies with uh, all of the other companies within the dealer socket value stream, uh, we will be able to do things that other companies can't. Most notably, take all of this information that the user configures and integrate it with dealer socket CRM and desking. So um, desking is a term used by car dealerships when they're desking a deal or like you go sit down at the desk and like come up with your payments, right? That's desking. So, they use a software that dealer socket we have called desking to do this. And it, it usually it's the customer telling the salesperson or sales manager or F&I person what they want, what their trade's worth, all this stuff, and it goes into the desking tool. Well, now we'll use the tools that we have from Inventory Plus, from dealer socket CRM, and from desking, and obviously our work to put all of that together 
so that if a user goes through this process, finds a payment that they like that's very accurate, they can go in, spam is in the desking tool, and they can literally just kind of validate all the information that's correct and get out the door. So um, it, this will change the way people buy cars. It will reduce the time that it takes for someone to buy a car. And I think it will be a huge differentiator for um, the company as far as what we can do that others can't because they don't have the synergies between companies. So super exciting, but still way uh, off from you know being delivered. We, this is not in development. These are this is an interactive prototype, but it is not uh, you know none of these integrations are. Uh, rock solid. So again, we want to keep you apprised of this stuff because we think it's super exciting. We hope you know you do too. But again, this is not something that we can share with customers. We might hit roadblocks. Uh, we don't know when it will be out. But this is what we're working on, and uh, we're super stoked about it. That's uh, that's digital retail. So that is it for what we had planned to talk about. We didn't take any questions thus far. Are there any questions about what we're working on, why we're working on it, or anything specifically about any of the things we talked about today? Here or online, I'll check the chat. Um, let's see. Seeing zero questions. Any questions in the room? No? We did everything perfect. Couldn't have worked on anything different. Awesome. You hear that, Jennifer? I need to raise. It's all perfect. Yes. Okay. Yep. Uh, yep. So the the limit. Lower yeah, upper limit. Lower yep. Same with down payment. Um, if you know you got a Highline store that sells, we have a few that sell the two hundred thousand dollar cars. We didn't want to set arbitrary limits of like you can put up to twenty five thousand dollars down because you know the ballers over here that buy the brand new cars all the time, uh, they might you know laugh at such measly down payments that the rest of us would consider very impactful. <laughs> but anyways, yes, it, uh, yeah, it, the, the slider limits are, um, are based on inventory. I'm not really born talking about this. Is there any specific reason as to why long forms like, have to be available? Because I know um, just for a website users that shorter form step forms will always perform better on conversion. So I'm wondering if there was like some sort of compliance I think the goal will be to phase them out. Right now, we haven't uh, just because it's for current platform, but it's very possible on engine sticks that we don't have a uh, a one step form. Well, in the in the uh, the form builder will allow you to do multi step forms, and some of the the native forms that we're building in for like uh, need assistance, contact us, share this with a friend will be multi step forms by default. Um, but yes, they convert better and. I think a, a very long-term goal um, is what your step for every form field, like first name, next, last name, next, uh, or you know what's that magic number? Um, so we're at least with Engine Six specifically building in the capability to allow us to do any number of different steps for any kind of form um, very easily and then we'll hopefully hone in uh, with a b testing and all sorts of stuff like that to figure out scientifically statistically what's best best conversion rate etc um, we will use uh, a b testing software through third parties like optimizely and we have very capable analytics teams that um, can help us figure out so that, yeah, we know. There'll be some of the UX resources that we'll get from merging design into um, the product team as well. So we could, even before we build it, we'll do front end tests um, before we even dedicate resources to build it before we know that it's going to be the most effective option. So that's one of the exciting parts of bringing that team on with ours. But one, I, I think a goal is to really do proper A B testing. Like if we come out instead of saying, like, well, we tested eight people. And six people, you know, I mean, like sample sizes need to be representative populations. They need to be statistically significant. We're going to put out white papers. Like we want to be able to say, like, no, our data team is better than yours. This user test that XYZ vendor did is crap. Like ours is actually 
like scientifically real. Um, so that's the uh, that's the goal is to be smarter than everyone else and make dealer fire the smartest choice in the industry. Got to get some good data people first. <laughs> Anything else from the room or online? We got another one in the room. That's down to the ATL. So yeah, so we want to prohibit certain people from making certain changes, just like we do today via ACLs and Ignite. Um, so potentially, yeah, depending on the site build and what the agreement is up front, we could have pages that they can't edit at all, or they can only edit the content. They can't rearrange or resize. So we're going to build out a really strong set of uh, ACLs or requirements uh, uh, based upon what level you're at. So we don't have everybody changing everything and kind of ruining the sites themselves. But in certain setups, if we have a, like a Van Tile, who's a very complex um, group who has development resources in-house, we'll probably open up the floodgates for them and say, just manage your site, similar to like a Squarespace. But a small mom and pop shop will probably say, hey, just let us know if you want to change something, we'll take care of it. There's a should be advertised. Yeah, it's, it's going to be advertised. We got with the, mar the marketing department who were also represented. Danae and Mary Lou were in the meetings with Google where he uh, saw this From Google. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Big one. Oh, Kevin was asking. Yeah, we, Genevieve just asked if we could restate the question uh, so people on, on yeah. the line could hear it. Uh, the answer to that was, I, I suppose, Kevin just asked if we are allowed to advertise the uh, the click through rate uh, win that Google provided us. The answer is yes, absolutely, and we plan to. Um, and just to revisit that real quickly, you see, you search for something on Google, you see ads, right? The click through rate is the number of people who click it versus over the number of people who saw it. And our click through rate is 50% higher than the average in our industry, our, our competitors that are still in these high platform, small business premier partners. Um, so we're building ads that are more relevant, uh, that are more engaging than our competitors by 50%. So that's really awesome, uh, a really awesome stat that dealers, uh, of course, would want, right? Yep. And or targeting better people with those ads, right? So it's a right. combination of both. Uh, was there any Google to get uh, Google reviews on the home page now? We so that. that may not be available, so this is specific to SEM uh, PPC. We, we will have access to, to potentially discussing that with them directly. So through these guys, they have contact and analytics and all the other teams that are represented. So we'll, we'll try, but it's not like an in for that per se. I don't think the thing there is they don't want us taking the reviews off of there because they want people to have to go to Google to see the reviews so that they can display more ads so they can make more money from us. So they're going to be hesitant to, to say yes no matter what. But we'll certainly see if we can make some inroads. There are some uh, kind of like roundabout ways of doing that. I know Kevin could probably speak to this with more authority, but AutoNation, for example, works with a third party called Reputation.com, who one way or another imports those Google reviews. Scraping. And, yeah, they scrape them. And then we have an API set up so that we can then take their scrape data and put it uh, wherever we want. So all of our 185 AutoNation websites are going through this massive overhaul where they're in, in, including a lot of user reviews and testimonials onto their sites, and those do include Google reviews. So it just, you have to force the customer to use a third party who goes through that kind of arduous scraping process that we don't yet have. But then we can do it. <laughs> Anything else? You know where to find us in the meantime, if there's any other questions. At an airport. Yeah, probably. at an airport, probably not near you. Um, otherwise, thanks for joining again. Good to see the numbers. Hope you enjoyed the fruit snacks and or uh, juice boxes. Thanks, cool mom. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Talk to you guys soon. Thanks, everybody online. Yeah, probably okay. sooner. Okay. Thank <laughs> you.